Welcome to the Lockdown Lowdown Volume 5 with Eric Krasnow. How are you doing, Kras? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. I um, appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for joining me. Good to Absolutely. see you in your studio there. Look at all yeah. those fun toys behind you. Yeah. it's You know, I'm, I'm thankful to have this space right now because in lockdown mode, it's nice to have a lot of instruments and toys to uh, play with, you know? Yeah. So you're keeping yourself busy uh, off yeah. the road and in that studio? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been actually on that side of things. It's been nice because I've had this studio and living here for just over a year, but was on the road most of that time. Or when I was here, it was producing a particular project. So uh, I'm still doing a lot of different projects, but I'm also getting to like experiment a little bit and and write for a new album you know i'm kind of in the beginning stages of making a new album i've also been like recording some cover songs for different tribute things that have been going on so that kind of sparked an interest in, in doing some kind of uh some sort of ep of of, of cover tunes so oh. and i've also been recording a couple songs like i recorded a one of the one of the tedeschi trucks band songs that i wrote with uh or that i co-wrote uh, years ago, and I'm thinking about recording some of the my own versions of songs I've written for other people, which is um, just kind of an idea that sparked because I had time, you know, right. and I had never recorded some of those songs. So it's, it's been having fun, like with like having some time to to uh, delve into details on some of the recordings, and you know, play a drum kit and play keys, and I've been forcing myself to play other instruments as well because I'm here by myself. So right. That's been another project too. So I see the guitar that's closest to you physically, right behind you on the stand is your signature model Ibanez, right? Yeah, yep, yep. It's a beautiful guitar and congratulations. You know, even if you did nothing else, you got a signature model guitar. I mean, that was like yeah, everyone's that's... dream, right? So yeah. What, what, what is it about that guitar that makes it? The um, oh. It's interesting, you know, it was an evolution. I, I, uh, got to get pretty detailed in the in the building of it i had used an ibanez many years ago the george benson model which i loved and then john schofield was on we were on tour with schofield and he introduced me to them and the first one they sent me this as200 i fell in love with and then years later there were uh derek trucks actually gave me this 335 and i always loved that there were certain aspects of that guitar that i loved and I took elements of that and elements of some other guitars I played over the years and kind of was able to build this Frankenstein of, of uh, you know, ideas coming from a bunch of different guitars. So they were really cool about um, letting me go crazy with that. Right. <laughs> and you play it a lot, right? Yeah, I play it. I play it a lot. You know, I've, I've been playing a few other, I've been playing a lot of different things lately, but whenever I do for, for soul live and when I do the E3 thing, I pretty much always play the, the EK model. So E3, you got a brand new album out. Live at Garcia. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I didn't realize, so I read some stuff. Here. This is, that was the second time you guys played together. Yeah. I, I, we go. played. That was the first show that we booked. And then we like last second ended up playing this little set at Rockwood as like a warm up gig the night before, just cause they like needed to fill a slot. And we we're like, okay, fuck it. Let's just go, go play there. And that was kind of our rehearsal. And then we played this gig, you know, it was, uh, we still hadn't learned like a ton of songs at this point. So you'll see there's like three, there's it's like half covers, half originals, but the energy in the room that night was really great. And you know, sometimes, the second gig is so much fun that like it's not really about how tight we are it's just like the energy is um there because we're so we're just excited it's a brand new project so i think we captured we bottled that um yeah, i listened to it and i'm like oh you know that we could have been tighter and i i, I could have been uh, a little bit more precise in my playing but i i decided you know what let's just put this out there because the energy is awesome and there's like some really cool improvised moments there and it's also, I think, like, you know, since nobody's going to be taking a second of, like, posting, not that you can really do that in a trio anyhow, but, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. really, like, when you're, when you're new like that, I'm sure you're just, like, you're so locked in and listening to each other. For sure. You know, because you, you don't want to miss a, 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 a turn, or, you know, when, when you have a little bit of that 
um, you know, it's almost like a beginner's nervousness, but, you know, channeled through an obviously non-beginner's <laughs> skill level and, you know, uh, um, comfort with each other. For sure, for sure. And I've played with those guys in different contexts, but never doing like that style with the organ trio. Um, so it was, it was cool. And, and Eric Finland, both him and Eric Cow, they have this connection that's really pretty cool. And Eric is so great doing the left hand and the organ stuff. And, you know, it just, it just, it made sense when I met those guys, like we should just do this and we're all named Eric. So it's <laughs> right. I mean, I know they, they chose them for the cool name. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, both Eric and Lynn Eric Calvo are great. Um, you know, they're both regular members of Friends of the Brothers. Uh, yeah. My, my band, and, you know, I had a blast playing with both of them. And, uh, you know, with that, we have two drummers. One is almost always Dave Diamond. And the yeah. second scene is rotated uh, Cal, with Cal and Van Romain and Lee Finkelstein, you know, depending on availability. And right. I, I set up with my acoustic right in front of that drummer. So I'm super tuned in to the differences. And they're all great and they're all a little different. Yeah. And Cal is, you know, he's just fun. He likes to like, you know, mess around and 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 throw some things in there and see if he can, you know, get a, a solo going in a different direction. Mess with yeah, yeah. Um, so it's fun. But what is in, in a in a trio setting, now you're obviously really used to it. I mean, in terms of instrumentation, that E3 trio is the same as Soul Live, right? Yeah. Keyboard yeah. Heaven. So um Obviously, you've played in a lot of different settings. How, what do you go back to? Like, what do you, how do you play differently um, in that setting than in any other setting? You know, with a trio, it's so cool because there's two harmonic instruments. So moving around like Im improvisationally is so easy, especially if you have a good communication happening. But like you'll hear on the recording that there's various times where chord changes are kind of introduced into a solo section that have never been there before but I can kind of hear him going there and he'll give me this little nod and then we're there versus looking at the bass player and then looking at the keyboard player and then making sure the other guitar player you know it's like just one guy and then Cal's right there with him you know with both of us but um and Neil has that ability too to like hear where I'm going with my solo and then throw in a different chord change and I'm there with him. And it just opens up um, the possibilities uh, in the moment and right. the spontaneity. And it, 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 I mean, it three sounds pretty different than Soul Live, really, even though it is the same instrumentation. Yeah. You're the same, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, is that something like, like when you go sit down with Eric? the era to start playing with kids you discuss that like guys i don't you don't have to copy or, or do you not even have to worry about that you're just yeah I, did, I don't have to worry about it too much but uh yeah i mean part of it is like the material is obviously different but yeah it's a different touch you know with with soul live we really just bash you know and it's a and it's become so much more like rock and roll which i love um and with this we really wanted to kind of take it back to like a just an organ drums and not like a tons like clavinets and bass rigs and really just going down to the the uh the basics and uh also just we decided to kind of make it a really like a soul jazz like thing you know and and it's it's really fun i mean it was something that we never took that seriously and we were like i mean we we just really wanted to like do what we love to do and let everyone kind of do their thing. Like there's different songs that's where Finland kind of will go off for like 10 minutes and there's drum solos and it's like more of like a throwback, but we, we try to modernize it. But, you know, you think of like Lonnie Smith and, and Grant Green just having these like jam sessions and trying out different songs every night. And, you know, it's uh, that every show that we've done has been completely different from the other and we change up the set list and try different things so and, that, and that's why the e3 trio is also such a cool name because obviously it's the three eric but anyone yeah. who's tuned in at all to what that means it's you know play off b3 organ b3 trio. Yeah, yeah and you are doing a more traditional b3 trio approach in that yeah for sure for sure um, so before you do that, like you've, you've done such a wide variety of gigs, so, you know, you've done that, done Soul Live, of course, Lettuce, played a ton with Phil Lesh, you yeah. know, I saw you with Irma Thomas and you've done that, that you know, you've done so much, yeah. you with Anderson Pack. 
Tedeschi Trucks band. In addition to the songwriting, you did a whole summer tour as bass player. Yeah. Do you, before you do any one of these gigs, throw yourself into a new headspace? Or do you, you, like, like before you play with Phil, will you, like, immerse yourself in Dead? Will you immerse yourself in Grand Green before the E3? Or do you let it all just come out? I do a little bit, you know. I mean, actually, the inspiration for doing the E3 thing was partly because I went to Texas to do this um, Grant Green tribute with this great organ player. You probably know Mike Flanagan. Oh, plays yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy yeah, Vaughn. Mike and, is awesome. And we delved into that Grant Green stuff, and it just kind of brought me back. You know, when I joined Soul Live, I didn't know that music as well as people thought. Like, we were really doing our own thing, and I kind of caught up as we were going. Like, oh, great. Like, I knew Grant Green, but it wasn't like, I didn't delve into the material until later, you know? So I, it was just kind of cool to go back to that that material and just like take a hollow body guitar, plug it into a Fender and like, you know, cause I've been doing so much with a lot of effects and more like rock tones and I love that too. But it was something fun about just kind of going like super basic, you know? Um, and so that was the inspiration behind that. And I did listen and for that month, I was listening to so much Grant Green from doing that and then randomly got asked to do some liner note stuff for the Grant Green re-release. So when we were starting, when uh, when those guys were asking me, hey, let's do a trio, I was like, yes, let's do that. And we'll call it E3 and we'll do more of like stuff in that vein. Um, and the same thing happens when I get into, I, I go I'm a rab I go down rabbit holes. It's, it's, I'm known for that. I nerd out. Like when I got in, when Phil asked me to start playing with him, you know, unfortunately I didn't have that much time to do the work but in the time that i did have i was listening to the grateful dead constantly all different eras I and mean, i was a fan when i was younger but had never really learned a lot of the music by the time i was playing seriously i was into other things but um yeah i delved deep and uh, that that hasn't stopped i'm still yeah. still delving into that music. and the way phil runs his thing as far as everyone else tells me it's not like he's sending you, okay, we're going on tour, here's the set list, learn these 25 songs, right? He's telling you like 75 songs, 100 songs, and he has, he yeah. has no idea which of them he's going to play. Uh, certainly you don't, right? Yeah, that was a challenge. Um, the first run of shows, there was like 60 or 70 songs that, and that I got the night before. You know, so I basically didn't sleep. I just learned all that stuff. And then those interchanged throughout. And uh, in certain cases, he's like, Crash, sing this one. And I've never sang it, you know, and then that night I'm singing it. Um, as time went on, we started having more of like a conversation because he started to know me, what, what I wanted to do, the songs I liked. And we started to email with each other and create set lists when I would be playing with him. And so, but the first few runs were, were, were uh, a lot of work, you know. And also it's one of those things where you're playing in front of these fans that are so into the music and they're going to know every nuance of the song so you can be nerve-wracking you don't want to mess up the lyrics on like right. a rock, on, a, on like a hunter garcia right song. it's not uh, like, right it's not like a, it's not like singing uh you know a blues song where yeah. a certain amount of interpretation is sort of you know it's, yeah. cool. it's welcome you know true well but, but i also will say that phil i mean not lyrically but musically is very open and also he wants us to bring our own thing to it and wants us to um you know not completely abandon abandon uh, the original recording or whatever but he doesn't want to stay true to any of that he wants to make it new which i really respect i mean he could easily get the same band play the same songs and people would come but i think what makes it so cool is that he's bringing these different people in and he's trying different songs and trying different arrangements every night. I mean, he's, he's the first guy at rehearsal and he's working all day long on his tone and the set list and he'll rehearse songs. He's played a zillion times again and again. It's uh, what yeah. Phil's done is incredible, you know, and, and as, as a fan, you know, you have to put up with occasionally you might hit a show that doesn't soar in the same way, but, Right. He's done something incredible, and it's been like a Grateful Dead University. And yeah. he, he, to me, it's ensured that for the next, um, however, decades, you know, the next generation, the music is going to, the music would never die anyhow, but it's going to have this legitimacy. There's guys like 
well, obviously his, you know, Graham and all the kids, yeah. Ross and the guys from, from his band, but you, Luther Dickinson and Scott Law and Jackie Green and Ryan Adams. And yeah. I mean, I'm just, you know, this is just the start, right? Of the guys who have played with him. Yeah. Um, and you can carry that music forward with so much more legit. I mean, you could have anyhow, but it's not the same. And you've been through yeah. Phil Lesh University, Grateful Dead University. And it's incredible. It's seeding that. Uh, approach to music and, and this, you know, legitimacy that's going to carry on for sure. I love it. No, I'm thankful for it. No pun intended. I've been, I'm grateful for it. Um, it's it's um, been also really great for my songwriting, um, you know, just delving into that music and also kind of from that music delving into other things. And it's it's been just a really, really, really cool experience. And I've tried to absorb as much as I can, yeah. you know, playing with him and, and all the guys from the dead. Yeah, it's amazing. And and the other guitar, is that, that other guitar sitting, is, is that the sitting on your chair back there? Is that oh, the yeah. John Mayer? Yeah, the Silver Sky. Yeah. yeah. And last time I saw you with Phil in Central Park last year, was I think it was, you played that guitar all night, right? Yep, yeah, the red one, which is yeah. back there, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love playing that one. I like having the the single coils for the dead stuff, or at least having like, you know, uh, five way doing, being able to go out of phase, um, stuff like that. So yeah, and that guitar is just really fun to play, really easy to play. They did a really good job um, putting that together. Yeah, it's a truly unique hybrid guitar. <laughs> yeah, very um, cool. So you also have the, your new podcast, Plus One, uh, yeah. which is are you know, six, seven, eight episodes in, right? Yeah, I've recorded a ton um, during the quarantine, actually. I think we've posted five. Okay. And yeah, uh, just, yeah, these yeah. are, just for those of you who don't know, these are one-on-one -on -one interviews with Eric and uh, various guests. Uh, Dave Matthews was the first one. We've had Chris Robinson, yeah. uh, Marcus King. Uh, who else am I missing? John Mayer's episode is airing on Monday. And um, I mean, I've talked to Quest Love, Don Was, uh, Alan Stone, Adam Deitch, tons of a, a ton of people. And, and, they're, and they're great, you know, because um, I mean, they're all they're great people and they're your friends and associates. And you have, you know, you can bring this sort of familiarity uh, and obviously musical knowledge to it. So um, they're very cool. I urge anyone to check them out. If you're if you're care enough to be watching this, you definitely want to check that out. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. You know, I mean, like you said, it's it's a lot of it are are friends of mine, but I'm actually um, learning a lot from doing it. You know, not only the process of doing it, but just from a lot of their stories and a lot of things I didn't know about these people I've known for years. You know, uh, we're getting into some good stuff. So it's, yeah, it's been it's been really cool. So um, when you suddenly popped up in, I guess, the 2015 as the bass player for Tedeschi Truck Band, that was that was surprising to people who knew you as a guitar player. O'Keele had left uh, yeah. the band, and they, they were going on tour. They played with some different people and needed a bass player. Um, and I thought it was great. But, I mean, tell me, like, you know, you actually started on bass, right? So just, like, yeah. on a strictly musical level, is it, are you is it comfortable you know, with a gig like that on bass, did you have to woodshed a lot to get ready? Or? You know, I really thought that I was going to be. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I play a ton of bass. I mean, I, I just hadn't played like two hour sets of bass every night um, behind someone like Derek Truck. So it was challenging for sure. But, um, you know, I started on bass um, when I was 13, I think, and then switched to guitar or, at, you know, started playing guitar as well shortly after. Um, but I, I play bass a lot on recordings, you know, whenever I'm on sessions, I kind of interchange with guitar and bass and, you know, I'll, I'll play gigs here and there, but that was, uh, you know, I was in, had been in the studio working with Derek and Susan down in Jacksonville and been playing bass on some demos and, and we'd been writing together. And at one point they were like, well, what do you think about just joining the band for a little while? And I was like, oh, that sounds fun. Um, <laughs> We kind of knew that it wasn't a, a permanent position, but it was a really, really fun time. And what the tour that the main tour that we did was with the London Souls and the Black Crows. And that's where I got to know Chris and also Tash, 
and the London Souls guys, I had just produced, I had recently produced their album. So it was like this whole family, you know. Yeah, it was great. I saw that at show at the Garden State Art Center, which is yeah. what we called that. And uh, that was the first time I saw the London Souls and saw Tash and, you know, yeah. up there and just become a buddy and, and everything. It was great. Yeah. And a great guitar player. Love Tash. Guy. He's like yeah. my little brother. Yeah, he's an awesome dude. Um, so what you obviously have known Derek for a long time. You played with him. You did all that songwriting with him. Um, did my feet get messed up? No, every, can you hear me okay, Craig? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, I thought that. Uh, you obviously had known Derek for a long time. You had this relationship. You'd already songwriting. But like you said, playing a whole show with him night after night is going to be different. Did you get any kind of new level of appreciation for his playing or understanding of his playing by standing on stage with him and uh, playing with him every night? For sure. You know, I realized that he can do that thing that I see him do every single night. <laughs> you know? um, and, you know, we toured together back in like 99 as well. and Did a massive, like a, a ton of shows with Soul Lab and, and Derek Trucks band. But yeah, watching him, you know, command that huge band and, you know, also just leading a band like that, even off stage and being the, you know, dealing with all of the day to day with that many people is also challenging and keeping everybody's spirits up and, you know, and just beyond music, he's just a great leader, you know, and has a very solid vision for what he wants to do. Right. So yeah, I, I really look up to him and Susan um on a lot of levels i mean the first time i ever heard of you in soul life was uh you know derek played some cool lick in the middle of a solo at the beacon yeah the next either after that show that night or the next day i saw him like derek what was that thing you played i think it was in jessica and he's like what i don't i don't know and then i was and i was trying to like describe it and he goes i don't really know what you're talking about but Chances are like 98% of it was a soul live lick because O'Keele and I look at each other and do them all the time. And then he yeah. told me all about you guys. So that, that was, that was, and that came directly from you having toured with their trust band. Yeah, so, for sure. And you know, what's funny is they put out a live album from that era, the Allman Brothers. And the, we got publishing because they played a few of our licks like like a whole section of a soul live song in in one of theirs. I don't I don't remember. Yeah, I think it's song. Jessica, but but they actually gave us publishing on that album, and like yeah. to this day, I get like you know little bits of yeah. check from from VMI that are from the Allman Brothers, and I remember. Well, they didn't even tell us they'd done that in like six months later. You know, I forget how we found out, but like our publisher or someone was like, hey, by the way, you're getting uh, something from the Allman Brothers. I'm like, what? That's really cool. Yeah. That um, really cool. You told me once uh, that Stevie Ray Vaughan was a huge influence. On sure. You. Um, can you talk about Stevie a little bit and specifically what we had talked about before with the Live at Elmo combo? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd say the Live at the Elmo combo video changed my life. That's what made me really want to be a guitarist and strive for that level of playing. Um, he just, he took a lot of like traditional kind of blues licks, but added this like fierce attitude to it. And, you know, one of the things that I've talked about with other guitar players is like most of us could play at his um, level of intensity for about 20 seconds <laughs> and he could do it through an entire solo through, through an entire song through an entire night um, so his intensity especially on that El Combo show I, I just always envision like the sweat pouring down his yeah. face and uh, it's when Soul Live eventually played that room I was so excited it was the last show of our tour and I remember we walked in and it was kind of like this dumpy place but I was still like just so uh, excited to play in there because I wore that V. I had it on the VHS and I wore that thing out to nothing because <laughs> I used to watch it over and over and over. And then you, something kind of special happened to you guys at that show, didn't it? Yeah, that night Mick Jagger was at our show and as a result of seeing us that night, they asked us to come on tour with the Rolling Stones yeah. from that gig. So that was a special gig in a lot of ways. Uh, it turns out Charlie Watts had 
listened to Turn It Out and was a fan of, of the album, uh, the Soul Live album, and kind of spread it around with, with the band guys and said he wanted to have us open, which was pretty different, man, to have a instrumental organ trio. You know, a lot of the other bands that had been opening for them was like No Doubt and right. uh, like more pop bands. So. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so um, you've also been doing quite a bit of production work, right? So any, anything in particular, and, and just, just something you did a few years ago I want to give a shout out to, I just listened to it again, and it's so great. It's the Aaron Neville record. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. because uh, Hercules is my favorite Neville Brothers song. And that was, that that was the song that was, that was like one of the template songs. Was, yeah, that, you know, it sounds, that's cool. It sounds like it. Yeah, yeah and when he called me initially, he was like, I want to make an album that's uh, in the vein of Hercules. And I was so excited. And he was like, I heard you're the man to talk to. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so we, um, yeah, that was a really cool process. You know, he sent me 50 poems and said, you know, I want to make songs out of these. So I helped craft those into, into songs. I mean, it was just the coolest experience. Working with him was one of the highlights of, of my whole life, I should know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell me about what you're producing, what you're working on now. Um, oh, I'm working on a new record of my own. I'm also working on a pro project with Tash that's kind of like a, we were playing with, with calling it Crash, which has a lot of weird comments. Mm -hmm. I mean, because my name and his name, but also like he's, we, there's been a lot of, he's had some crazy experiences with yeah, Crash, obviously. Yeah. So we have a- From a, guy, a, from a car crash, for yeah. those who don't know, listening, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of an emotional name for him, but uh, we've got some cool songs that, some of it we had worked on um, in the London Souls days, you know, as potential songs for London Souls. And then we kind of revisited those and then wrote some other ones. And so I'm really excited for that. Um, I'm producing an artist named Kat Wright, really great singer. Um, some of you may know her. She's been touring with the Wood Brothers and uh, her band is awesome. She's out of, she's from Vermont, super soulful, um, amazing songwriter so we're like kind of in the midst of that and uh i'm actually working with ziggy marley on some stuff i hope that that turns into a full-length album but we're we're working on some tracks together um so there's kind of a, a lot of stuff there's a guy named james the eighth who's a, a young guy who's an amazing guitar player singer and we've been working together for over a year on his record and we're just about to finally release uh, the first single, but he's super talented, great singer and killer, killer player. All right, that's cool. He was on American Idol actually, but he's kind of, he was on American Idol doing a certain thing, and then he's rebranding himself, you know, with this stuff now. How did you? Um, one of the things that impressed me and it impressed my kids because I could show them a picture and say I knew you was when you popped up jamming with Anderson Pack. Oh um, yeah, yeah. And Anderson is so great. Um, how, what's your relationship with him and where, where did that come? you know we know each other not super well um but i i had produced an artist named wax who he had worked with a lot and they shared the same band and so we met through him and then i know a lot of his bandmates maurice brown obviously right. played with me a lot and i know all his other the band guys through this guy wax who's also a great artist so we've met on various occasions and he he's a fan of lettuce and he came to Soul, see Soul Live at Brooklyn Bowl kind of recently. And I know Thunder, I've known Thundercat for a long time and they're pretty tight. So we have like various different connections. I, you know, we're not, uh, we don't talk often or anything, but he's, I'm a huge fan of his. Yeah, uh, he's great. And uh, yeah, Thundercat is another one, just fantastic. Yeah. There's, there's so many parallel worlds, you know, there's our whole jam band world that we were talking about. And then, you know, Thundercat, Anderson Pack, and Kamaki Washington, you know, there's sort of a parallel track, you know, that's got a foot in the hip hop world, a foot in the jazz world. But yeah. In some ways, isn't really that different in approach to some of No, that. definitely. I mean, in the early days of Soul Live, I met Thundercat, his, Steve, and I've I met Kamasi years ago too. And it's all, you know, it's been great to watch them. Yeah blow up but i've known those guys forever you know and they've been making great music for a long time yeah major major talents i hope uh, yeah sure people check them out um listen eric always good to see you i'm glad to see you yeah. up. And, and wait I, we didn't mention the most important personal news 
You got married this week. Yep, yep. Congratulations. We're still going to have like a time. proper wedding, but it was a quarantine, just like quick wedding. But yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. And we got a baby boy on the way. So a lot, of, a lot of big changes. And he's, he's due in September, right? Yep. So I, I hope uh, my birthday is in September. So is my wife. So you got to. Oh, uh, cool. And we'll, we'll send him presents every year. If he's, oh, if he's, I appreciate that. And one other thing, you know, we have, we have a personal thing in common. I forgot to tell you this. You know, my father is a retired pediatrician, a uh, trumpet player, who when he oh. retired, when, <laughs> he's a Dixieland trumpet player. He calls himself Dixie Doc. Oh, and, uh, wow. He does. <laughs> you know, since he retired, he's been gigging. So, uh, and your father also, I think, is a physician who plays music, right? Well, it was actually, it's my grandfather, my okay. grandfather, um, who's no longer with us, but he was a, um, a surgeon and, uh, be, you know, he retired in his fifties, retired kind of early and decided to become a full-time musician. He played his whole life, but he played uh, gypsy music, primarily violin, but also played piano. And right. yeah. And so he kind of jump-started a career at like 55. Amazing. Pretty cool. Um, well, good luck with the baby, and uh, I hope to see you in our normal hangout environment before too long, backstage or side of a stage somewhere. <laughs> me too. Either, I mean, me, either the Brooklyn Bowl or one of our spots, yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, I just hope there's music live again. It's, it's, it's our lifeblood, you know, professionally, and, and, and absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? Like, not that we didn't all know how much we loved it, but now it's just like, well, you can yeah, it, right? definitely will not be taking it for granted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, we'll be well. Stay healthy. Good luck with everything. All right, you too, man. Thanks a lot, right. Alan. Appreciate it, brother.